Oh, we got to pray and I got to give you a dharma. I forgot about that part. Actually, um, there, uh, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you two darbs because the first darb is so bad, it demands a second one. But the second one is, is good. And if you don't like it, I can't help you because, because it, it is good. But let's pray first. Father God, thank you for today. Thank you for these students in this room. I pray, Father, that um, that we would not become so familiar with the cross and with the empty tomb, that we don't see its wonder, uh, that we don't stand in awe and amazement of you and of your love for us and the lengths to which you want to save us. We are grateful, Father. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. What do you call a cow with a twitch? Beef jerky. That was the one that I thought was horrible. Oh, I know. I know. I know. Okay, I know. this one is funny. When does a joke become a dad joke? When the punchline is apparent. That one's really good. Like <laughs> and it's true as well, right? What do you call a cow with three legs? <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that. Then there's the like, ground beef one. Yeah, the cow with the legs. Ground beef. Well, it's kind of okay. So uh, open up your books. I don't know what page uh, you need to be on because my books are different. But, um, but we're talking about. Um, uh, we're starting at the part where it's talking about a very uh, large. Stone. So these are post-resurrection circumstances. So the stone was removed uphill. Um, and this is Sunday, of course. Um, and, uh, well, let me give you a little bit of background on this first. Um, the disciples didn't run away from Jerusalem. They didn't go off to some other part of the world uh, to preach, at least not immediately. Of course, they eventually did, especially Paul did, but he wasn't a disciple at this point. Um, they went right back to Jerusalem, a place where this happened. If what they were teaching was false, the message never would have been received. It never would have gotten off the ground. People would have laughed at them. No, he died, and we found his body. It didn't happen this way. There's no way. If the tomb was not empty, if nobody had ever found Jesus' body, that's the only way people would listen to them and their story. Because if Jesus' body had been found, everybody but the disciples had a vested interest in finding that body and displaying it. Don't you think they would have done that? They would have found it, and it would have, and Christianity never would have happened. Um, so, don't you think that it's reasonable uh, that there would have been one historian, one eyewitness, one antagonist that uh, would record for all time that they had seen Christ's body, but nobody did. Nobody recorded it because nobody saw his body after he was dead. Unless they witnessed the resurrection of Christ. dead man. So let's talk about some of the improbabilities of uh, something other than the resurrection happening to Jesus. And the first one is that the stone, that the, the two ton stone, right, the 4,000 pound stone, was rolled uphill because it was rolled down into a trench. The only thing that would be harder than rolling a stone like that would have been getting it in this small uh, space up an incline. Who would have been able to do that? Uh, John twenty verse one says, "Now the first day of the week, uh, now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb." That word taken away is arrow, A-I-R-O, and it means to pick something up and carry it away. It isn't just that it was rolled to the top 
of the trench, it was gone. It wasn't there at all. Who did that? Who carried away so that it wasn't even nearby? It was gone. Um, and if the disciples had wanted to come, steal the body, and tiptoe around Roman guards that were armed, uh, it, and and roll away a one and a half to, to two ton stone up a slope, uh, that it, 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 that isn't what happened based on the evidence. It looked like somebody picked it up and carried it away. And they definitely couldn't have done that. In fact, nobody, no group of anybody could have done that. And the soldiers would have had to have been deaf and blind to have not heard and seen the stone being moved. Now, they did see what happened. We'll talk about that in a minute because that's the next thing, that the, stone, the, the Roman guards went AWOL, absent without leave. They fled. They were frightened. These are men that don't get easily frightened, right? These are men that, that aren't afraid of much of anything. But it would be pretty freaky to see an angel come down from heaven and a stone to just literally disappear, a 2,000, or excuse me, a, a two-ton stone to literally just disappear. And they were so afraid that they left. So it says uh, in Matthew 28, it says this, While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while you were asleep, while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble because the punishment for falling asleep on guard was death. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So if the soldiers were sleeping, how could they say it was the disciples? That's like you sleeping through the night and finding out that someone had been in your room and you said, well, it must have been Joe. Or it must, you don't know. You're asleep. You don't know who was in your room, right? And, uh, and they didn't know it either. Uh, either they were asleep or awake. But if they were awake, why would they allow the disciples to take, or anybody to take the body? And if they were asleep, then they couldn't have known that the disciples were asleep. Uh, so the Jews' argument that the disciples stole the body does not dispute that the tomb was empty. Everybody said the tomb was empty. Nobody said Jesus is still there, and nobody produced his body. And that's a problem for those who don't believe in Christ. Um, and then we have the grave clothes. Because if the disciples would have stolen the body, you wouldn't think that they'd take him mummified, right? And just be like, it's okay, Jesus, just lay, just lay still, Jesus, just wait till we get you home, right? So, there, so there, if they did that, there'd be no grave clothes, right? But what would they have done before they carried him out if they if they didn't want to carry him with the grave clothes? <laughs> Unwrapped, right? The whole thing. And it would be a mess. Uh, on the ground of sticky aloes and, and oils and crushed up wood um, on, on the floor. It would look like a teenager's room, essentially, uh, or something to, the, to that uh, regard. And, and here's what Peter 20, but here's what, here, here's what uh, John, excuse me, uh, three, 23 through 9 say. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running. This is John writing, by the way. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. John's just making sure everybody knows that. Uh, he bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, I'm just going to make sure you understand. I'm faster. He's slow. Yeah. Uh, arrived and went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. 
Finally, the other disciple, finally, finally the other disciple who had reached the tomb, tomb first uh, also went inside. He saw and believed. We don't know what he believed. Maybe he believed Jesus had resurrected. Uh, maybe he just believed what the women said, that he, that he was missing. Um, they still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. The wording there connotes that the grave clothes were undisturbed. They were exactly as they were. There was no body. Um, this is this is what it uh, says uh, in, in the book. It is not hard to imagine the sight which greeted the eyes of the apostles when they reached the tomb. The stone slab, the collapsed grave clothes, the sheet, the uh, the shell of the head cloth, and the gap between the two. No wonder they saw and believed. A, a glance at the grave clothes proved the reality and indicated the nature of the resurrection. They had been neither touched nor folded nor manipulated by any human being. They were like a discarded chrysalis or cocoon from which the butterfly has emerged. So once again, the passion of the Christ uh, depicts this resurrection. So uh, I'm going to play one more uh, video for you. And the, the PowerPoint is going to go back to the beginning again. I can't stop it from being that old fashioned. Like the resurrection isn't scary. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you would be. Yeah, yeah. 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 the scene for the Hollywood kid. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. like, yeah. it makes him real dream. I've definitely thought about it. He's crying. Get on your hands. Now, here's here's another uh, fact about the resurrection, and all four Gospels tell us this, uh, that uh, that the women were the first to see him alive. Um, if that's not true, it's ridiculous to state because women weren't even allowed to be witnesses in court. They were they were seen as as unreliable witnesses. And in fact, I can't remember which gospel says it, but it says, oh yeah, here it is in, in Luke 24. It says, but they told the disciples, but the disciples did not believe the women because their words seemed like um, to them like nonsense. Um, women were not reliable. Relim women, a woman's word is not was not reliable. Yeah, sure, Jesus. That's a good one. Don't joke around. This was sad, right? 
They probably they probably were really upset at the women, but all four gospels say that. There is no reason if you're trying to convince ancient Jews that something amazing happened, you do not create a falsehood of women being the first. The only way you write that is if you want to write the absolute truth, and that's it. That's the truth. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. Um, so, according to, to Jewish uh, law, they were they were there. Any evidence from a woman was invalid, uh, which might have uh, something to do with why the disciples didn't believe him. Um, and then, this the next thing is that uh, Christ's uh, appearances were confirmed by eyewitnesses, not just the apostles, but many eyewitnesses. And this is going to, um, this is going to uh, sound very familiar to you. Now I would remind you, brother and brothers, and, and, and Paul is writing here about the centrality of the resurrection like the key to, the linchpin to our faith. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive in which you stand, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you have believed in vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance to the, with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, Peter, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as one to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. So Paul is not the only witness of the resurrection. James was his half-brother, was Jesus' half-brother. He did not believe in Jesus until he appeared to him. To him. Uh, alive, and then he believed in Jesus. All of Jesus' brothers, uh, Jude, that wrote Jude, was another half brother of Jesus. So this not only speaks to the centrality of the of, of uh, the resurrection, uh, it also forces us to think: okay, there were a lot of people in Jerusalem that saw the risen Christ, and Paul is essentially saying when he says that he appeared to more than five hundred witnesses at one time. Most have still are living, but some have died. He's saying, look, if you don't believe me, ask, ask one of them. They'll all tell you the same thing. It wasn't just the 11 who saw Jesus alive. So many people saw Jesus alive and, and claimed that resurrection. Um, so uh, as Thomas uh, Hale puts it, if Jesus had, in fact, not risen from the dead, Paul could, have not, could not have written these words. There were too many people still around who would have called him. If I said to you that when I was in the cafeteria at lunchtime getting my lunch, a pink unicorn walked through the lunchroom. I believe it. Well, thank no, you. I, I appreciate I, you. You, uh, yeah, that you believe me. But I have to prove that, wouldn't I? This is Jesus. Oh my and, God. And if everyone who was in the lunchroom had the same story, maybe I bribed them, bribed them, right? But surely there's one honest person in this school that would say, uh, "Oh, there was <laughs> nobody." Nobody said it was a hoax. Nobody. And they all went to their deaths um, proclaiming the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and so it, it passes the bounds of credulity that the early Christians could have manufactured such a tale uh, and then preached it among those who might easily have refuted it simply by producing the body of Jesus. Nobody did. Because nobody had the body of Jesus. Acts 1, 3, and 4 say this. He presented himself alive. Jesus presented him alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the uh, promise of the Father. So that was the Holy Spirit, the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. 
So in dramatic fashion, the resurrection of Jesus Christ changed the course of history. 2,000 years later, this, this man uh, uh, is still being worshipped, is still being talked about. Critics who wish to deny the resurrection of Jesus Christ must adequately, ad, must adequately explain away seven historic, at least seven historical facts. Oh, nope, that's not on there. I lost it. Oh, there. Okay, that's fine. Um, the feared power of Rome was ignored by breaking the Roman seal at the tomb. That doesn't make sense. Why would a fishermen and, and tax collectors do that? Both the Jews and the Romans admitted that the tomb was empty. Everyone said the tomb was empty. The two-ton stone, which uh, was somehow moved from the tomb entrance while a Roman guard's uh, watch, not just rolled away, gone. Where'd it go? A highly disciplined Roman military guard fled their watch and had to be bribed by authorities to lie about what actually happened. The undisturbed grave clothes no longer contained a body. Christ subsequently appeared to as many as 500 witnesses at one time in a variety of situations. And because of the law, Jewish, uh, the, excuse me, because of the low Jew, view, Jewish view of the reliability of women, manufacturers of a resurrection story would never have selected them to be the first witnesses to the fact. Now, I'm going to fly through this because we already talked about this last year. Um, so um, the first one is the unknown tomb theory. This says that Jesus was buried in some burial pit. We don't even know of that uh, custom in Judaism. There, there's no evidence of that custom. There is later that there were pits that were built that were common graves. But at this time, there, there weren't that kind of burials. Uh, and so uh, that doesn't even make sense. It's, it's anachronistic. Um, but but it's, it's also, uh, why would they have secured an empty tomb? Because when they said make the... The, the, the whole process of burying someone and guarding a tomb included checking to make sure the body was there. They would have done that. They would have checked to make sure the body was there. Uh, the next one is the wrong tomb theory. The women who went to the tomb were standing there as uh, Jesus was being embalmed and buried by Joseph and Nicodemus. Surely they were familiar with it. But even if they weren't familiar with it, Joseph knew where that tomb was. It was his tomb. It's like me going out. The day that I walk out to the parking lot and walk around going, which one's my car, is the day that you tell Mrs. Shrug it's time. It's time for you to put me in a little office with a, with a computer that's not really hooked up and let me think I'm doing work that I'm not actually <laughs> doing. Right? Oh, yes, sweetie, I'll write your recommendation. And I don't even know your name, right? So... Uh, obviously, um, Joseph would have known where his own tomb was. Uh, and then we have the weekend at Bernie's uh, theory the, that the disciples stole the body and just walked around Jerusalem with a dead guy and nobody noticed uh, that he was there. You hadn't heard me say that before? No. Very. I, mean, I said it last year, but you were in 10th grade last year. Uh, yeah, don't actually watch the movie. It's not a good. I've never actually watched Which the movie. movie? Yeah, Weekend at Bernie's is about yeah. these two young, yeah. Yeah, these yeah. two young kids, young guys, whose very very wealthy boss invites them for a weekend at his his seaside uh, palatial house. And when they get there, he's dead. So they dress him up and they make him look alive and they put sunglasses on him and they go about doing everything they would do anyway with this body that they're trying to get away, pass off as a, as a live guy. Yeah, there. There's no way that that um, the disciples could have gotten away with that. Um, and, and the disciples didn't even know to steal the body. They didn't think Jesus was going to rise from the dead. They didn't know that. So they didn't know to fake a resurrection. Um, so uh, and, and the guards wouldn't have allowed it. They would have had to get in, uh, uh, you know, in, into the tomb. They would have had to pass through the, the guards, and obviously they couldn't have done that. Uh, and then they knew what they were doing was breaking the law. They would have faced imprisonment and maybe death, maybe a crucifixion of their own for trying to fake a resurrection that they didn't know was going to happen. 
Doesn't make sense. The authorities stole the body. They could have done that, but why? Why would the authorities try to steal the body? Um, uh, they, they, they would have supplied the body if they could have, but they didn't. If they had the body, everyone would have known it, but they never did. Uh, what I call the Soon Theory, the Resurrection Theory, what I call the Princess Bride Theory, he was just mostly dead, he wasn't all dead, uh, and in the cool of the tomb, he somehow revived uh, and uh, was uh, brought back to health. You met somebody you tried to uh, yeah, I've heard people use that. Yeah. The, so the so Muslims say one of two things. He, he They say he didn't die on the cross. So either they believe this, or other Muslims believe that he had a twin brother or somebody who just looked a lot like him oh, yeah. died on the cross in his place. Um, like the prestige. And, 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 then, he, and then he shows up. But then, <laughs> but then if, if he didn't actually die on the cross, so well, he wouldn't have, a crucifixion is pretty obvious, right? Yeah. So there, there would have been no nail prints. And he um, got, like, scored. Yes, yeah. Would have, if you, really, I think if, he, if they just would have left him after the scored, he might have gotten close to the house. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was, yeah, he was nearly dead before he even got to the cross. Yeah. Uh, so let's look at the aftermath. Let's look at the results uh, from the resurrection. The lives of the disciples changed forever. They were never the same. They went from this motley crew of misfits who were afraid of their own shadows, to heroes of the faith proclaiming the truth of the gospel to anyone who would listen. Every single one of them, except John, was martyred in a horrific way. Some were crucified. Some were beheaded. John was definitely persecuted. He died in exile on the island of Patmos, reportedly at a very uh, old age. So he had a natural death, but he was definitely persecuted for his faith. Um, in the history of psychology, it has never been known that a person was willing to give up life, their life for what he or she knew to be a lie. People die for a lie. All kinds of people die for a lie. A bunch of guys got in a plane on 9-11, and they died for a lie. Every one of those Muslims died for a lie. Nobody dies for a lie that they know is true. They die for a lie that they believe it to be. You're not going to die for a lie. I'm not going to die for a lie. Will I die for something I believe? Um, and so they were in a position to know it was a lie. They wouldn't die for a lie. They wouldn't. They would have. All, all they had to do is repent. And if Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, they'd say, "Yeah, we made it up." But none of them did. They all went to their deaths. The church began within a few weeks of of the resurrection. Jesus, or excuse me, Peter preaches at Pentecost, and 3,000 people come to Christ, and the church is born. Uh, immediately, immediately, uh, worship changed, right? And, and there's a celebration of Easter instead of the Passover. And they celebrate on Sunday from the earliest times of the church. They celebrate on Sunday because of the resurrection, not Saturday. Saturday is no longer the Sabbath. Sunday is from very early times. Uh, in the church. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, historical evidence supporting the resurrection also is available. I'm just going to read a few uh, quotes for you, and this will be about it. Professor, Professor Thomas Arnold uh, wrote this, The evidence for our Lord's life and death and resurrection may be, and often has been, shown to be satisfactory. It is good, according to the common rules for distinguishing good evidence from bad. Thousands and tens of thousands of persons have gone through it piece by piece as carefully as every judge summing up on a most important case. I have myself done it many times over, not to persuade others, but to satisfy myself. I have been used to, to, used for many, many years to study the histories of other times and to examine and weigh the evidence of those who have written about them. 
I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved better, proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Christ died and rose again from the dead. Dr. D. James Kennedy wrote in a Why I Believe, the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ has been examined more carefully than the evidence for any other fact in history. It has been weighed and considered by the greatest of scholars, among them Simon Greenleaf, the Royal Professor of Law at Harvard from 1833 to 1848, who helped bring Harvard Law School to preeminence, and, and who has been called the greatest authority on legal evidences in the history of the world. When Greenleaf turned his mind upon the resurrection of Christ and focused upon the light of all the laws of evidence, he concluded that the resurrection of Christ was a reality that it was a historical event, and that anyone who examined the evidence for it honestly would be convinced that this was true. Um, and so then what should be the impact on us? I think of the strongest words yesterday. The truth of the resurrection demands a response. We can't just walk by that and say, cool, we can reject it. Or accept it. You can't remain. Paul Little in his book, Know Why You Believe, he said this, either Jesus did or did not rise from the dead. If he did, it was the most sensational event in all of history and gives us conclusive answers to the most profound questions of our existence that become familiar to me. From where have I come? Why are we here? What is our future destiny? If Christ rose, we know with certainty that God exists and that he is like and, and, and what he is like and that he cares for each of us individually. The universe then takes on meaning and purpose and we can experience the living God in contemporary life. And then Max Lucado in, uh, his, book in, six hour, uh, in his book Six Hours on Friday. Those six hours were no normal six hours. They were the most critical hours in history. For during those six hours on that Friday, God embedded in the earth three anchor points sturdy enough to withstand any hurricane. Anchor point number one, my life is not futile. There is truth. Someone is in control and I have a purpose. Anchor point number two, my failures are not fatal. The one who has the right to condemn you provided the way to you make mistakes. God doesn't. He made you. Anchor point number three. My death is not final. He only went into the tomb to prove that he could come out. And on the way out, he took the stone with him and turned it into an anchor point. And he dropped it deep into the uncharted waters. And as C.S. Lewis says in my favorite book, Near Christianity, Jesus is either a liar, or a lunatic, or he's Lord. Those are our only choices. Because he wasn't just a good man. A good man wouldn't lie, right? Um, and he was either a liar, or he's crazy. crazy. Or he's Lord. And again, I think that this man's um, a, a, a verdict with, um, like, uh, Josh. Uh, evidence that demands a, a verdict. And that we have evidence of the resurrection of Jesus Christ today. That's it for today. And uh, we're done with this particular lesson. Uh, you won't have a quiz over this. You'll have a quiz over five and six together, and then we'll be done with the semester. And then we'll only have one more lesson, required lesson, and then we'll get to uh, pick your lessons from there.